Hi everybody, this is Kim Opelinski from the Bega Team Royal LePage Norelta. Today I am going to be interviewing Matthew Kaup from Odlofsen and Kaup Law. Uh, good morning, Matthew. Good morning. Uh, how are things going with you? Things are good. Yeah, happy That's to be good. here. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. So. I guess we'll just get right into it. Um, I would like to know uh, what exactly does a lawyer do when doing a deal for a seller? For a seller, uh, a lawyer's role uh, starts really when you have a contract that is unconditional. So it's finalized, the deal's going ahead. A lawyer is going to do a title search, do a tax search, make sure all of the, the numbers are up to date. And then they prepare the transfer documentation that will be submitted to land titles. They meet with the client, have all of that signed. And they also take care of once the uh, transaction is going to close on the possession date, they take care of handling the money if there's a mortgage that's existing, they take care of paying that out and discharging it from title and giving the buyer that, that fresh start with the property. Okay, thank you. And what about, what's the difference between, what, what other things do you do for the, when you're representing the buyer? Is it similar or is there a few different things you have to do? Oftentimes with representing a buyer, you're dealing with a bank and preparing mortgage documents. If the purchaser is getting some kind of financing, that is part of the lawyer's role is to arrange that, make sure all the documents are prepared and signed properly. Uh, and that lender is going to be sending your lawyer your mortgage money on that possession date to send over to the seller's lawyer to close the deal for you. So that is the, the biggest difference when acting for a purchaser. A lawyer is going to be handling all of that financing documentation, making sure it's done correctly, registering it on the title, et cetera. Okay. Now, I know sometimes um, in our contracts, when we're doing contracts for buyers, we'll put something like, um, if such and such is not done by possession date, there'll be a hold back. Can you explain a little bit about what how a holdback works? Absolutely. So a holdback is just as you said, there's some obligation, uh, typically from the seller, that they need to provide something to the buyer or have something in the property repaired. And if that's not able to be done by the possession date, then the holdback is an amount of money that is held in the lawyer's trust account. And that is the buyer's insurance that that task will actually be completed. And so the theory behind a holdback is that it's enough money that if the seller defaults on their obligation to repair something in the property or provide something, that that holdback money is going to be able to pay for whatever needed to be done. That holdback money would be given to the buyer and then they could go and get this task done themselves and they won't be out of pocket any money. Okay. Now, I've never actually um, ran into this, but is there, does it happen often where um, a seller is just like, oh, I really don't care about that money. I'll just let them fix it. <laughs> does that happen like a lot or just very hardly ever? Uh, it's rare uh, because it's rare. most of the time that holdback is of the amount that it's going to very comfortably pay for whatever needs done. So if the okay. seller actually does it themselves, they usually get a little bit of money back from the holdback. And so that's their motivation to get that work done. Uh, but there are times, especially when there's some change, say in the seller's life, uh, an illness or they're, they're moving out of province or out of country that they they don't want to complete that item and that money is then just given to the buyer as, as compensation. Okay, thank you. So um, another thing is uh, a question is, um, have you noticed a difference in uh, your business since COVID-19 quarantine started? Yeah, there's been a, a, a large difference in just the volume uh, of real estate that's been moving. 
Uh, usually the, the spring season for real estate starts in April and, and continues into May, and there's a, a big rush of, of transactions. People have been thinking and considering all winter, and then now is the time to, to pull the trigger and get that done. Uh, we haven't seen the same level of rush that we usually do, uh, thanks yeah. to our, our COVID-19 closures and quarantine, uh, et cetera. But uh, certainly that is the biggest difference. Uh, we've also got some different requirements for meeting with clients to sign documents. Uh, yeah. We still are able to meet in person, uh, but we need to observe certain protocol and, and precautions, which we, we always do. But that's uh, a little different. You, I'm not shaking clients' hands anymore. Yes. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's been suspended. Uh, and occasionally, when a client is not able to meet in person, we do now have the ability to sign certain documents uh, electronically or have them witnessed electronically. Yeah. And so that's something that we can discuss with clients if they have a situation where they require that. Yeah, that's the same as us with our business right now. We're doing a lot of virtual tours instead of actually having people go in the homes. We're also, if we do take them in the homes, we're having to use gloves, sometimes masks. If, if um, the client wants a mask, we provide them with masks. Use different pair of gloves every home, like it's a new pair of gloves every home. So it, it can be a, a task, but we are open for business. We are doing everything. I've actually noticed this last two weeks, it's gotten busier. So hopefully you'll start getting busier. <laughs> Yeah. As well. So can you explain to us what title insurance is? The title insurance is uh, an insurance policy that in Canada, at least, it, it covers a, a very specific set of circumstances. So most people know what a real property report and compliance is. That's a survey of a, a property with the municipality's stamped approval for the structures on that property meeting bylaw requirements. And so a title insurance policy is something that is often provided in lieu of that real property report and compliance. It covers the scenario where the structures on the property are not built in compliance with the bylaws. Uh, that insurance policy will kick in and pay for repairs or moving things rather than knowing what the issues are beforehand with the real property report and compliance. The title insurance policy covers those things if you don't know if they comply or not. Okay. I have noticed a lot more in the last probably year. Um, realtors in the realtor remarks are putting, you know, client will provide title insurance instead of RPR. Do you find that there's more and more people wanting title insurance instead of the RPR? So it's becoming a more generally accepted substitute for a real property report. There was a time when not many buyers would accept that in lieu mm -hmm. of a real property report and compliance, but as their banks and lenders are coming around to the idea that it's an acceptable substitute, so are buyers. And the attraction of a, a title insurance policy is the cost. You're looking at usually uh, $220 to $250 for a title insurance policy, whereas getting a real property report, the survey alone is going to cost around $600. Yeah. And then applying for compliance to a municipality is another 150 or so. Uh, and so the, the cost difference is, is one of the biggest attractions for a seller providing title insurance instead yeah. of that real property report and compliance. Yeah, and I do notice as well, like when they do have that the seller will provide uh, title insurance, we do sometimes as real estate agents by request of our buyer put in the contract that seller wants an RPR. Uh, our buyer wants an RPR, I mean, and uh, the seller usually will will agree to it because they want to sell their house, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When when you yeah. think about it, I mean, a thousand dollar or seven hundred and fifty dollar bill uh, is is small potatoes when that is what a, a whole deal is hinging on. Yeah. Okay. And my last question for you today, Matthew, is. Um, 
cost-wise, is it more expensive for using a lawyer on the seller part or the buyer part, or is it the same? Well, so it depends on what a buyer is doing. If a buyer is getting a mortgage, it is a little bit more expensive than selling a property. That reasoning is because the financing documents take more time, it's more work, and so a purchase and mortgage is more expensive than a sale. That being said, if a buyer is paying cash for a house and not getting any financing, that is less expensive than a sale because the amount of paperwork and effort required is, is lower. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for doing this interview for me. And uh, it will be up on the YouTube channel and on Facebook and Instagram. Um, if anybody needs a lawyer, Matthew is does a great job. You can reach him at 780-459-2220. And if you need any help doing real estate, you can reach me at 780-566-7974. Well, Matthew, you have a great day. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Stay safe and uh, we'll be in touch. Perfect. Thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you.